Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 27. Everybody found that? I'll go ahead and read. Y'all bear with me on the pronunciation of some of the names. I tried to look up all the ones that were kind of hard, but I think y'all understand and get the picture. Amen. Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse uh, 20, uh, 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahar, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity and Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahar took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahar's wife, Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Going on to uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. So tonight we're going to be talking about Abraham. we got to lay some foundation work to get to where we're going, so I'm going to need you all to stay with me. The title of this message is Home Away From Home. Home Away From Home. Uh, in chapter 17, I'm going to go ahead and deal with it now, even though it's five chapters later. Uh, Abram's name changed from exalted high father to Abraham, father of a multitude. The reason I go ahead and bring that out, even though it's five chapters later, is so that I can call Abram Abraham for the entirety of the message. Is that all right with y'all? All right. So Abraham was born and lived in Mesopotamia, more specifically in uh, southern Babylon in Ur of the Chaldeans. So Ur is the city and the Chaldeans are the people. They were a polytheistic people, meaning that they worshipped many gods. Abraham's father Terah was actually a maker of idols. Now I want to bring out a point here. Don't tell me that God can't use you because your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa or your family member did something a long time ago. Here we see Abraham's father being a maker of idols and, and worshiping many gods and still Abraham uh, and still God called on Abraham and used Abraham in a great way. Amen? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. He doesn't call the equip. He equips the call. Right. Moses killed a man. He was of a slow tongue. And God called on him and used him. <clears throat> so Abraham was called to give up his kindred. Kindred means family. He was called to give up his family and, and to leave his native country and to go out not knowing where he went. He was called to go into a land that he perhaps had never heard of before and to possess that land. Now notice the promise that was made to Abraham. We just read it, but we're going to read it again. Genesis 12, 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God told Abraham to leave his family behind. But what did Abraham do? He brought uh, Terah, his father, and also Lot with him. You see, everything God told Abraham to leave behind, he brought with him. They didn't even make it to Canaan. They actually stopped halfway between uh, Mesopotamia and Israel at, at, in a place called Haran. In life, many times God calls and we only halfway obey what he said. Can we say halfway faith? Halfway commitment. We could even say that many people, maybe even some of us here, are Heron Christians. God called us 
God told us what to do and how to do it, and we know that He has our best, best interests in mind, but yet we still only half obey the call. So what was it that got Abraham to leave Haran? His father died. It was affliction. It was pain. It was suffering that finally drove uh, Abraham out of Haran. You see, many of us bring afflictions on ourselves because we are not out and out for the Lord. We are not sold out for God. God had plans he wanted to work out through Abraham, and he could not work them out as long as Abraham was in Haran. God has plans he wants to work out for you, but we haven't completely submitted our, our life to his will, so we find ourselves going through trials and tribulations so that we will come to the end of ourselves and finally completely submit to the will of God. Man's strength has to be broken before he can be used. Man's strength has to be broken before the man or the woman is useful to God. So guys, nothing significant happened in Haran. They were wasted years and God went silent on Abraham. God wouldn't even talk to him. But aren't you glad we have a patient God, a loving God, a kind God, a persistent God, that even when we give him half-hearted faith, that he doesn't give up on us. We need to get out of the driver's seat and let Jesus take the wheel. Jesus shouldn't be in the passenger seat. We should be in the passenger seat. Jesus should be the one driving. So Abraham finally left Haran when he was 75 years old. I want you to think about 75 years old. Now, if anyone's close to around the age of 75, I'm not picking on you. I'm not saying that's old, but I want you to think I'm 28 years old, and I don't know that I would have wanted to walk 1,300 miles through the mountains and through the desert like this man was called to do. 75 years old, he finally left Haran. When he got to the promised land, he found it inhabited by great and warlike nations. So here he is, 1,300 miles from his home. Not only was his faith being tested, but he found other strong and hostile nations there. And he had not been there long before a famine hit the land. So what does Abraham do? He wanders down into Egypt and he gets himself into trouble. Egypt represents the world. A little famine or a time of struggle hits our life and we start questioning God and asking him why he has brought us here. Fear and doubt begin to creep into our minds. Well, God, haven't I done everything you've asked? Haven't I obeyed you? Instead of putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, we begin to look elsewhere for comfort. We end up finding ourselves out in the world. Instead of relying on God to mold us into the image of Jesus, we start molding ourselves into the image of the world. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. God has called us to be separate from the world. Separate from darkness. It's a sad day when you can't even tell the difference between the people in church and the people in the world. The people in church are doing the same thing that the people in the world are doing now, guys. You see, the very famine God sent to mold you and save you from yourself has now become an avenue for the enemy to walk into your life and destroy you all because you didn't trust God and you went your own way. Instead of waiting on God, we look to alcohol for comfort or drugs or tobacco. We begin sinning and going back to our old ways. God's unrepentant sin begins to harden and callous the heart to the things of God. I know you know what a callous is. It's a, a man or a woman who, work, who works hard, maybe uses a shovel a lot. You know that, that their hands become, become callous. Or maybe you play guitar and uh, your, your fingertips become callous. That's what our heart does whenever we continue to embrace that sin and to walk in that sin and not repent of that sin. Our heart becomes callous to the things of God. And it, it can become very hard for us to hear whenever God is speaking to us, guys. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus came so that we may have life. So that we may have it more abundantly. We got an enemy that's seeking to destroy us. That's seeking to destroy your soul. He wants to bring as many people down to hell as possible. But thank the Lord for Jesus. Yeah. So Abraham had been in the promised land without the promised heir. God has promised that he would bless all the nations of the earth through him. And yet he did not give him a son. God said, Abraham, I'm about to save humanity. I'm going to give you a son, and he's going to be the heir, and by your seed all humanity will be saved. There is a son coming from you, and from your son is coming the son of Almighty God, and he's going to save humanity. 
So another 10 years go by and the promised heir still hasn't been born. <clears throat> the promise of God still hasn't come to fruition in Abraham's life. So he gets to talking with Sarah one day. She says, I'm old. I can't have a son. And she says, well, surely God meant for you to have a son with my Egyptian slave girl, Hagar. So Abraham has a child with her. And out of that comes a son by the name of Ishmael. Ishmael, who is the father of the Islamic nations of the world. If you want to read about Islam, then read about what God prophesies over Ishmael in Genesis 16, 12. It says he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. Does that sound like the Islamic nations of the world? Yes, it does. So at 86 years old, this is what you got. Abraham is living in Canaan. Now he's got a son born of the flesh. Nothing that originated from Abraham himself could ever serve God's purpose. We can't go our own way in life and carry out our own will and expect God to bless it. If it did not come from God, it cannot be blessed by God. Yeah. God don't bless no mess. And that's all we do. We make a mess of things. Right. Without the Lord, look, look what Abraham and, and Sarah did. They took things upon themselves. And, and they said, oh, well, God needs some help. We tired of waiting. They tried to bring it about themselves. Made a mess of things. <clears throat> Don't come to God with your religious disciplines, your laws, your own works to produce a self-righteousness. Remember, righteousness needs to be in right standings with God. God already provided a way of righteousness that doesn't need to be added to. That way is Jesus. John 14, 6. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Yeah. No man come with unto the Father but by him. Guys, another 13 years go by. Abraham is now 99 years old. In Romans 4, 19 and 20. I'm trying to go slow when I, when I say the scripture. Romans 4, 19 and 20, if you want to flip there. <clears throat> it says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now did. When he was about 100 years old, Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Let me translate that for you. There, is, there wasn't any more life in him. There wasn't any more fight in him. Abraham was finally at a place that he was ready to lay down and obey God. God took a dead womb. He blew the dust off that dead womb and he brought forth life from it. Matthew 22, 30 said, 32 says, God is the God not of the dead, but of the living. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says that God formed man from the dust of the earth. And he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And man became a living soul. In Ezekiel chapter 37, remember the, the valley of the dry bones, that those bones came back to life. We serve the living God. Yeah. Guys, the, the promise there came forth, uh, Isaac meaning laughter. It was a miracle that Sarah being 90 years old and Abraham 100 could bring forth a son. This goes to show you the power of God and that what he said he would do, he will do. If he has made you a promise, it will come to pass. Not in your timing, but in his timing. So don't lose faith. Be patient. You see, when you get to the end of your own talent, the end of your own self, the end of your own skill, then God can begin to work. God allows us sometimes to, to he allows us to go through trials and we go through that valley and he wants us to be patient. He don't want us to just end it however we want to end it. Whenever the time is right, he will reach down into that valley and he will pull you out. But we got to be patient. We got to have faith and we got to wait on him. Isaac was a gift from El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. And through one of Israel's son, Judah, we got King David, King David and ultimately Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So guys, we say all that to finally be able to explain the title of the message, which was Home Away From Home. Abraham was called from his home to a new home, from a home of sin and idolatry to a home of godliness and righteousness. We have all been called from a home of sin and guilt to a new home of godliness and righteousness. 
You and I were all comfortable in our home of the world, living in sin, doing whatever it is that we wanted to do, instead of what God called us to do and who God called us to be. God wants us to no longer live in the darkness of this world. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, right. but rather reprove them. If you don't know what to prove, but rather rebuke them. Rebuke them. So guys, there's so much more that happened in Abraham's life. Circumcision and all the different things. But that, that's the part of Abraham's life that I really wanted to cover. And I want to bring four points to you that we can take away from the life of Abraham. Four points. Point number one is obedience. Abraham was obedient to what God had told him to do. Although his father led him out of her, he was still obedient. He obeyed God by being willing to leave his home. He did stop halfway, but he never gave up and still kept moving forward toward what God has promised. Are you being obedient to God in your life? Are you following the will of God? Has God spoken to you and you haven't listened yet? Psalm 128, 1 says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. Point number one was obedience. Point number two is trust. Bible says in Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Remember that Jesus had not yet come and died for the sins of humanity. He had not yet come to provide righteousness for us to have a relationship with God. So because Abraham believed God, he was counted as righteous or in right standings in the eyes of God. The Bible also says in James 2.23, that Abraham was the friend of God. Abraham trusted God to lead him the way to the promised land. Have you trusted God to lead you in your life? Would you leave everything behind that is familiar to you and go without knowing your destination, just like Abraham did? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the law with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. Point number three, faith. Point number three is faith. Abraham had faith that God would do what he said he would do. Even when he grew to 100 years old, he never lost faith in what God had told him. That a promised heir, a child was coming. Maybe you have been waiting for God to do something in your life and it just hasn't come to pass yet. Philippians 3.14 says, I press Toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. We got to press on no matter what, guys. Yeah. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. You can turn over to it if you want, if you, if you, if you are still in Romans or not. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. You see that thing you're dealing with is working some patience into you. Patience gives us experience. When I go through something or I'm waiting on God to bring something to fruition in my life, I can remember back to the last time I was pressed by life and know that God brought me through that time. So because of so because of my experience, I know that God will see me through this time. I just have to be patient and wait on him. Point number four, surrender. Point number four is surrender. Abraham finally surrendered to God. He finally quit fighting against God and he submitted to his will. Many of us need to surrender our life to Jesus. Get rid of a half-hearted faith and purify a wholehearted faith. We don't need more faith. We need pure faith. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I love this scripture. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In this life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is saying his old man was crucified with Jesus. It's no longer him living in the flesh doing what he wants to do. It is not a Holy Spirit living in him, directing him to do what God wants him to do. Paul realized that Jesus loved him died for him. Paul put his faith in that plan and he no longer lives according to his own will. He lives out the will of God for his life. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, if you want to go to it. <clears throat> it says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Guys, the flesh wars and battles against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. If that sin nature you inherited from Adam is still controlling you, then you will see the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But if I am in Christ, my flesh and or sinful nature no longer controls me, I now walk in the Spirit, which the, the fruits of the Spirit are in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And we just read it, but we'll read it again. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its afflictions and lusts, or its passions and desires. So guys, look, I want to pull all four points together. Abraham demonstrated all four of these points in Genesis chapter 22. God told Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac for a burnt offering in the land of Moriah. What does Abraham do? He wakes up early, right away, the next morning, and he sets off for Moriah on a three-day journey with Isaac. So they arrive, and I, look, I, I want you to see this here, that, that uh, God was revealing his plan to Abraham, and we can we can see it right now, 2,000 years before, before Jesus ever came, that God was revealing to him the redemption plan, all right? <clears throat> Abraham puts the wood on Isaac's back. Jesus carried the cross. Abraham builds an altar for the sacrifice. The altar is symbolic of the cross. Isaac asks where the lamb is for the sacrifice. And Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. Jesus is the lamb of God. Abraham bound Isaac. Jesus' hands and feet nailed to the cross. So Abraham took the knife. He raised his hand to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out from heaven and he said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Angel of the Lord said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes, and a ram was caught in the thicket. So Abraham took that ram, he offered him as a burnt offering, and he called that place, anyone know? Called it Jehovah Jireh. I can I, I, I can see Abraham up there. Isaac's probably still bound up like this, and Abraham's probably walking all over that mountain. Jehovah Jireh. God is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Anytime I think about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider, I always think of like material things, even essentials like food and water. He is my provider in those things. But what Abraham is saying is he's my Jehovah Jireh, that he's, he provided a sacrifice. And he's my Jehovah Jireh because God provided a sacrifice for me. He provided a sacrifice for you, a sinless son, Jesus, to come and die on Calvary's cross and shed his innocent blood. He is our Jehovah Jireh. Guys, God revealed to us the plan of redemption 2,000 years before Jesus ever came. All four points. Abraham obeyed God immediately. He trusted God's plan. He by faith offered his only son and he surrendered to God's will. Those four points in our life when we are obedient to God, trusting that God's plan is best. We show these by placing our faith in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, which surrenders our will to God's will. Guys, God wants us to accept the sinless sacrifice that he provided us. We need to put our faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross of Calvary. When we put our faith in that plan, an exchange takes place. We get Jesus' righteousness. He takes our guilt. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us after that. And if we would allow him to have his will and way in our life, that he would begin to circumcise our heart. And circumcise means he would begin to cut away those things from our inner man that do not be, need to be there. But guys, we, we, have to, we, we have to give him free will and reign in our life. He will mold us into the image of Jesus Christ if we would allow him to. 
The Bible says that God is the potter and we are the clay. Does anyone have any, any pottery experience? Anybody? I know I don't, but I, I looked up a video a few weeks ago to, to just to have an idea of it. But what that potter does is he sits down, he got that wheel spinning, and he grabs a handful of that clay and he throws it on that wheel. It's without shape. It's without form. But what does he do? He starts to work it. He starts to make it into something. He starts to make it into a cup or a bowl or a pot, whatever it is. Then what? He starts to smooth it out. That's what God is doing with us. In the situations that God alters for us, that you're starting to look a little bit more like Jesus. God is the potter and we are the clay. So you would think people knowing about hell would be running to God, crying out to him saying, save me, oh God, save me. Many people don't even know about hell because they've never read a Bible in their life. They think, oh, I'm a good person and God is a loving God, so God wouldn't send me there. Anyone ever heard of that before? Yeah. I know I have heard it. I tried to share Jesus with people like, oh, God ain't going to send me to hell. That's what they try to tell you. You know, maybe hell wouldn't be quite as bad if it was one year or 30 years or 100 years. But the lake of fire is eternal. The Bible says where the fire will never be quenched, where the worm doesn't die, an outer darkness, and that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It says that over and over in the Bible, that there will be weeping of gnashing of teeth. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. It says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Guys, after all of that, still the worst part is eternal separation from God. No more chances. It's inescapable. I'm not trying to scare anyone into the word tonight, but it's in the Bible. God wants us to know these things of, of where, where all the wicked people will end up, the people who haven't put their faith in, in God, that there's one true God, that they haven't put their faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. He wants those people to know where they're going to end up. In, in Luke chapter 16, I don't know if you remember this story, it's the story of Lazarus the beggar. And the rich man. You remember that story? Lazarus the beggar, he was, he was, full, of, uh, he was full of sores and he was on the outside of the, the rich man's gates and the rich man didn't give him any food. He didn't give him any water. What happens? They each end up dying. And uh, Lazarus the beggar is carried away into Abraham's bosom by angels. And the rich man ends up in hell. It said that he's in hell and he's being tormented in the fire. And he's looking over there at Abraham's bosom and he, he's calling out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus across that if he would just dip his finger in some water, if he could come across and just cool my tongue. And the, the point I'm getting at here is that, that uh, Abraham says that there's a, a great gulf fixed between the two. What does that tell us? That those people, that if you find yourself in hell or even in heaven, you don't walk back and forth. If you find yourself in hell, you won't have another chance to go across. That's what that great gulf fixed is right there. That you don't have another chance and you can't walk back and forth. <clears throat> Guys, uh, instead of people running to God, they are running away from God, and He is still the one knocking on the door of our heart. Revelation 3.20 says, Jesus says, I behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man would hear my voice and open the door, that I would come into him and sup with him, and he with me. He is saying, let me in so I can change you, make you a new creature. Make you a new creation. Praise Deliver God. you from the, the oppression, the depression, the change, the shackles, the weight, the addiction, the pornography. So I can deliver you from the sin. Let me in so I can change you and give you a new life. So I can give you a new identity. So I can give you a new home. A home in Christ Jesus. Yes. That if I would abide in him, that he would abide in me. God, where is your home today? Is it still in the world? Or is it in Christ Jesus? That's the question that I want you to think about, that I want, to act, that, that I want you to ask yourself. Y'all all right if I just like preach the gospel a little bit, talk about Amen. the gospel? Y'all yes. all right with that? Yes. I don't want you to be on, on scripture overload or anything. You don't have to write all this down, but I mean, the Lord's just been revealing things to me about just showing me the gospel. I ask the Lord, Lord, just reveal to me which scriptures it would be that I would need to learn to be able to to know the gospel and have it set, set aside in my heart that I will be ready to, to share it with people. Y'all all right with that if I talk this one a little bit? Romans chapter 5 verse 12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man, talking about Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. 
Romans 3.23, it says, uh, We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. All of us, every single one of us, man and woman, Romans chapter 1 through 3 talks about it, that all, all men, uh, both Jew and Gentile, are separated from God by sin at birth. That we're all born into it, right? Romans 10.9 says that if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that, that uh, I would be saved. You know what? In, in Romans chapter 6, is, we're talking about spiritual baptism there. Spiritual baptism. Not water baptism, but, but spiritual baptism. Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You see, anywhere that there was sin, there was an overabundance of grace, but that doesn't mean that we just, that we have a license to sin. That's not the case. What should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. What does that mean? That means whenever I place my faith in what God provided and provided, which was a sinless son, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit picks me up. He immerses me into Jesus. He, he picks me up. He changes my lo location. He changes my address. The Holy Spirit places me in Jesus 2,000 years ago, and that his death became my death, my old man, my, old, my inner man born about him. That his death became my death, and that his burial became my burial. You too. And that his, his, uh, his resurrection to newness of life became our resurrection to newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A new creature. A new creature. He doesn't say a rehab creature. God isn't running a rehab program. He doesn't say that you're a bandaged up creature. God doesn't slap a band-aid on you and tell you you're good. He says that you are a new creature. Therefore, you should walk in newness of life. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the face, I saw the Lord on a throne high and lifted up. Who did Isaiah see? He saw the Lord Jesus Christ 700 years before he ever came to the earth. You say, well, how is that possible? Because in the book of Revelation, uh, it says that Jesus was slain. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. That means that before, before God ever created man and woman or the earth, that he had a plan. That, that Jesus was slain from the foundations of the world in the year that King, King Uzziah died. That's a good, great indication that something in me has to die if I want to see the face of the Lord. You know what has to die? Self. Self. Adam and Eve, they, they fell. They fell from a state of total God consciousness where they only cared about what God wanted to self. They only cared about what they wanted. Amen? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2, and this ain't, this ain't too much scripture, huh? I just want to preach the gospel to y'all a little bit. That's all I want to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. You saved by grace through faith that not of yourself, it's a gift from God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You say by God's grace. God had grace. God's uh, unmerited favor. God's goodness given to undeserving people. I didn't deserve it, but God gives it to me anyway. Grace is divine influence on the heart and reflection in the life. You see, works tries to clean up the outside. But it's the inside job that needs to be done so that the outside can then become pure, right? The Holy Spirit's working in my heart. Grace is divine influence in the heart. He's cutting away and circumcising the things that don't need to be there. And it's reflecting into my life. Now people are able to see it. Right? Say by grace through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary for us. That's where our faith must be. The cross of Christ has to be the object of our faith. We say by grace through faith and not of yourself. That there's nothing in and of yourself that you can give for this. You can't ride a bike to it. You can't tie your way into heaven. You can't read your Bible enough. That's all your works. That's not what brings us in. You say, by grace, through faith, and not of yourself. Adam and Eve tried to sow uh, fig leaves to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin. God said, no, that's not how it's going to be done. Without the shedding of blood, that there is no remission of sins. Blood had to be shed. Say, by grace, through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. Grace and faith are a gift from God. Say, by grace, through faith, not of yourself, it's a gift from God, not of works, not of your own works. Your own works will not save you. So, guys, after all of this, now I'm justified. I'm justified by my faith. 
I have peace with God. It's Romans yes. 5 1. And I have access by faith into this grace wherein that I stand. This is how God did it with Abraham, that he was justified by what he believed, that he, he was justified by his faith. He wasn't justified by his works. If he did it like that 4,000 years ago with Abraham, then what makes you think that he would start doing it a different way now? All of this stuff in the church now about works, you got to do this anymore. You got to read your Bible more. Now let me tell you, that there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not demeaning works. We, we're going to want to do more works once the Holy Spirit lives in us and is controlling us. We will want to do more works and we will have new desires to read our Bible and to study more and to pray, but we can't put our faith in those things. Amen. That is what God provided, that Jesus already did it for us. Amen? Amen. Justified by faith, I have peace with God. I have a relationship with God now. That I am now clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Galatians 3.27 yes. says, yes. Therefore, if, any man, if you're baptized into Christ, that you have put on Christ. God now sees me clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. He no longer sees my unrighteousness, but he sees Jesus' righteousness in me. We are justified by our faith. We have peace with God. And we have access. We have yes. access. Amen. That you can walk right into the throne room of the King of Kings Hallelujah. and Lord of Lords. That you have access now because of my faith and what Jesus did that I am now justified. Justified. Romans chapter 4 and 5. Paul talks about being justified. That you've been declared legally innocent of all charges that were against you. That's what justification is. You like that, That's God sitting up there. You're no longer living under condemnation. But God is up there. He's the one in the courtroom. He slams that gavel down and he says you are justified by your faith. That, that everything that was against you, that you are forgiven. You're justified by your faith. You have peace with God. And you have access by faith to the grace of God. God's grace is able to flow through me now or to me now because the Holy Spirit lives in me. The Holy Spirit is the dispenser of grace that you have access. I'm, I feel like, you know, a lot of times we, 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 we go on through the work week. And I'm, I'm going to use a, like a, a, a physical person who has a hurt back to illustrate this to you. But I'm really talking about in the spirit. I feel like we're going through the work week and we walk in like this. You know, we're limping, barely getting by. No, he says you have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Yeah. That you can stand up. You can stand up that you don't have to, that you're not barely making it by like this during the week. You got access by faith because you're justified. You have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Amen. That you can stand up. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, let me tell y'all something. I was in... To bring it kind of back around to the message. I was in Heron once. I was in Heron. We all come to Heron at some point in our life. We got delivered out from the world. We got delivered out like Abraham from Ur the Chaldeans. We all pass through Heron. The main thing is, is that we don't stop there. There comes a point in time where, where God has delivered you. And you're going, to, you're going to end up being halfway. But we don't want to stop there and, and build our house there. And, and, or, or pitch our tent there. That he wants us to keep on going. Don't stay in Heron. Don't stay in here and waste time like Abraham did. I was there at one time in my life, guys. I was working offshore. I was, I was working 14 and 14, and the Lord had began dealing with some things, and I, I hated being going from home during that time, working that 14 and 14 schedule. It, just, it really wasn't my thing, but at the same time, the Lord was dealing with my heart on some things and dealing with me, and, 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 and He wanted me to, to get a lot of things out of my life that didn't need to be there, cursing and drinking and all these different things. And I found myself in a, a very bad depression. I was very depressed at the time. But you know what I was doing? I was living with one foot in church and one foot in the world. Anybody ever did that? Yeah. I think we've all been there at some point in our life. We definitely don't need to stay there. But God's Revelation chapter 3, uh, Jesus is talking to the church of Laodicea. And he says, uh, he's talking to the lukewarm church. He said, I could wish you was cold or hot, but you're neither cold nor hot. So I will spew you out of my mouth. Or he's saying, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Guys, that's what we're doing when we live in one foot in church and one foot in the world. We're being lukewarm. He said, I could wish you was cold or hot. You see, if you're cold, God can send someone to share the gospel with you and pull you up out of that. And get you hot. Get you living for Him. If you're hot, you're already living for God. But if you're lukewarm, it means you didn't really accept the gospel, but you didn't really reject it. You're better off be, uh, being cold. He said, I could, I could wish you was cold or hot, but you're neither cold nor hot. So I will vomit you out of my mouth. I will spew you out of my mouth. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter in at the straight gate. 
For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that go in by it. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And there are few there be that find it. Look, that path that we're supposed to be on is narrow. It's very narrow. But what do we do a lot of times during the week? We over here gossiping. We, we, we're walking down the path. And then we over here on Thursday gossiping about people. And then we get back on the path for a little bit. But then we get back off the path over here. We're drinking on Friday night at the bar or whatever. That's not what the Lord has for you. He says, enter in at the straight gate. That uh, the way is narrow. That it is narrow. 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And be ready always to give an answer to every man of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Sanctify means to set apart. Set apart the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to share Jesus with people, guys. Whenever I was going through that depression offshore, we had a uh, we had a meeting one night on a Saturday night, and what we had to do is we had to uh, we had to write down on a piece of paper our name, probably 50 guys in the room. Write, write our name on a piece of paper, and you'd pass that piece of paper around, and everybody would write like a good a good trait about you or a good characteristic. So I got my I got my paper back, and I looked at it. I realized it didn't have anything about sharing my faith. Didn't have anything about reading my Bible. I realized in that moment, man, I don't, I don't share my faith with people enough. I had told people about Jesus before, but it's hard to tell people when you're living with one foot in church and one foot in the world, you know? So I, I felt the Lord in that meeting that I felt like He was leading me to, see, to say something, but I didn't know what it was that He wanted me to say. And I don't know if you can believe it or not, but I hate talking in front of people. I still don't like it, but the Lord's drawing me out, and He's giving me what I need to be able to do it. But I don't like talking in front of people at the time for sure. So I'm sitting there fighting against whatever it is that the Lord wants me to say. And all of a sudden I heard like these three or four demons laughing at me. I can hear them. The most evil laugh I ever heard in my life. I can hear them laughing at me. They were laughing at me because I was fighting against what God wanted me to say. But they was laughing at me. Ooh, ooh. That ain't no good. We have to just keep on going. Boy, that was <laughs> Let me get a sip of water. Yeah, let me if I can find my, my bottle. Open the doors. Keep preaching, brother. <laughs> <laughs> tell you what. Darkness or not, I've been delivered out of that. Right? Been delivered out of that life. Amen. Y'all want me to keep going? Or I don't know. Could have just tripped the breaker, or maybe it uh. The power so I'm, I'm in that moment, I'm, I'm fighting against what the Lord would have me to say. And I raised my hand and I said, guys, I just want to let y'all know. Uh, when I'm home, I go to church every Sunday I can. I read my Bible and I just want to let y'all know that anything is possible with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And you know, that, that, was, that was maybe seven out of 50 people that came and shook my hand and thanked me. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee. That uh, my strength is made perfect in weakness. I was weak at that point. I was depressed. I, I, know, I know that God sent me some grace in that moment to be able to share what it is that he wanted me to share. And that's what I told those guys. And like I said, maybe seven of them thanked me. But uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says, uh, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those who are lost, and whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, guys. Many of those guys in that room, many people you share Jesus with, they're, they're blind to the things of God because they don't believe in their heart. They don't believe. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Guys, I, I went through that depression for a while. I ended up leaving offshore. The Lord gave me a new job. And I tell you what, when the time was right, God reached down, He pulled me up out of that valley, and He set my feet on a solid rock. His name is Jesus. Did He do that for anyone else here? Amen. 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 Guys, I, another thing I want to let y'all know, uh, you, don't need a, you don't need a Bible college degree to be able to get up here and do this. You know? I'm not demeaning that. If you feel the Lord leading you to get a Bible college degree, absolutely get it. That's not the point I'm getting at. I don't have a Bible college degree or anything. I'm not standing up here being prideful or boasting or anything like that. 
I just want to let y'all know that if you would just step out and do whatever the Lord called you to do, whether it's to share Jesus with people out there in the world, if it's, if it's Brother Matt asking you to get up here, the book of John says that Jesus sent the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, that He will lead you, He will guide you, and He will teach you all things that you need to know, and then He would bring those things into your remembrance. Amen. You got something far greater than even a Bible college degree. The Holy Spirit lives inside of each and every one of you if you are a believer. Start, start, start letting the Holy Spirit work on you. That if He's working on you, to, this is look. I shared two messages at the youth at the crossing place. I'm, I'm just starting to do this. I shared two messages over there. This is the first time away from church that I'm able to share with another group. But like I said, I, I don't like talking in front of people. And if it was under my power, I wouldn't be up here. I'm gonna tell you right now. I'd have been so nervous uh, back in April when I shared my first message to the youth. I wouldn't even got up there. I wouldn't have got up there the second time. I wouldn't have got up here tonight. But God sent the Holy Spirit that he would empower you to do whatever it is that he called you to do. To be where, wherever it is that he has called you to be. Amen. 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 And you know another thing guys. Don't, whenever we talk about sharing the Lord with people. Don't compare yourself to people. I used to compare myself to people. I look, even people here that came and preached that did such a great job. Went, Lord, how could I ever do something like that? I had never even preached a message a few short months ago whenever I was thinking that to myself. Lord, how could I ever do something like that? And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. He said, uh, he said, don't compare yourself to people. The same Holy Spirit that lives inside of that person lives inside of you. Right. He lives inside of your heart. And I'm here to tell you that too. That if the Lord called you to do some, do some or, or to share Jesus with people, that the Holy Spirit will comfort you and He will lead you and He will guide you. So guys, if you didn't get anything tonight, I, what I want to tell you is, is don't stay in Herod. Don't stay in Herod. I don't care if you built your house there, if you pitched your tent there for the last 10 years. You ain't got to tear your house down and move it. Just get on out of there. Amen. God got something far greater for you. Just keep on going to the promised land. Amen. Keep moving forward. Quit looking back at your situation and start looking forward. What did uh, God told God told Moses to tell the Israelites? They came up to the Red Sea and they started looking back at the enemy. And, and God, God, told, God, God told Moses to tell the children of Israel, move forward. Move forward. And he parted that Red Sea. Quit looking back at your situation and start moving forward. That God will make a way for you to get out of Haran tonight. Leave Haran. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. I'd like to uh, move towards the close. Uh, I'd be more than happy to, to uh, pray with anyone after. I kind of like that the, the lights went off and we was able to keep on going. We was going to keep on having church. We wasn't about to let that stop us, right? Yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead. We'll, we'll move towards the close and we'll, we'll close in prayer. And like I said.